February 8, 1931, James Byron Dean is born in Marion, Indiana, during one of the darkest years of the Depression. Millions of workers are unemployed. Thousands have lost their homes and are relegated to bread lines and soup kitchens. The Deans are more fortunate. Jimmy's father, Winton, is a dental technician employed by the government. His safe job and steady paycheck will help insulate Jimmy from the harsh realities of the Depression. During this bleak time, Jimmy's mother, Mildred, introduces her son to the arts. She reads him her favorite poems, and as soon as he is old enough, she sends him for dancing lessons. Theirs is a very special relationship. As an only child, Jimmy receives a great deal of his mother's love and attention. When Jimmy is five years old, the government transfers his father to Los Angeles, California. In 1939, three years after the Deans moved to California, Jimmy's mother becomes ill with cancer. Confused and frightened by his mother's deteriorating condition, Nine-year-old Jimmy watches helplessly as her beauty and energy fade. July 14, 1940, 29-year-old Mildred Dean dies. Jimmy is devastated. Without his mother to care for him, it's decided that Jimmy should return to Indiana. His father will remain in California, and their relationship will never again be close. In Indiana, Winton's sister Hortense and her husband Marcus will now be the ones to raise Jimmy. Jimmy is sent back to Indiana with his grandmother on the same train that carries his mother's body. Every time they stop, Jimmy gets off and runs to the baggage car to make sure his mother's casket is still aboard. Her death leaves Jimmy embittered and abandoned. Later, he will say, my mother died on me when I was nine years old. What does she expect me to do? Do it all alone? When Jimmy arrives at his aunt and uncle's farm, the Winslows do whatever they can to help him get over his loss. As the months pass, Jimmy slowly accepts his new life on the farm. During this time, Aunt Hortense, a member of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, encourages Jimmy to perform at the Back Creek Church by giving readings on the evils of alcohol. At school, Jimmy asks Adeline Knoll, his drama teacher, to help him with his readings. He was an unusual child. He was a precocious child. I knew that. He uh, liked to perform. His grandmother told me that, Emma Dean said from the time he was just big enough to stand on a table or on a chair, he'd, he'd perform, give his readings. In school, Jimmy also shows that he's talented in artwork and in acting. In his junior year, after a successful performance of Our Hearts Were Young and Gay, Adeline's drama students present her with an orchid. The next day, Jimmy asks for it back. Jim came over and he pointed to it and says, I want that, and I said, why, Jimmy? He says, well, you'll find out at the end of the day. The next day he came in with the, re with the painting. So he said, now you'll have it forever. So this is my forever piece. And instead of signing Jim Dean, he puts her pride, which is pretty sweet of him. While Jimmy is a student at UCLA, he lands his first professional acting job and makes his film debut. Pepsi Cola hits the spot. Jimmy is paid $30. In Jimmy's next few screen appearances, he will have little visibility. Pepsi gives more fun, more bounce to the ounce. With only bit parts and little recognition, Jimmy becomes frustrated in Hollywood and decides to try his luck in New York. September 1951. New York in the early 50s is the place to be. The Broadway theaters are thriving, and a new electronic marvel called television is offering opportunity to the legions of unknown actors, including James Dean. Are you ready? Jimmy's first job in television is on a show called Beat the Clock. 
The premise of this show is to perform bizarre and difficult stunts within a certain time frame in order to win prizes. The rules of the show stipulate that all of the stunts, no matter how hard, must be physically possible. Backstage, testing these stunts to make sure they can be done is none other than James Dean. October 1952, Jimmy's luck changes. He lands his first leading role on Broadway in a play called See the Jaguar. He plays the part of a vulnerable teenage boy who has been locked up all his life by his demented mother. The critics single out Jimmy for giving an excellent performance, but find the play silly and contrived. It closes within a week. For the next year, Jimmy appears in more than a dozen TV dramas. Then, in 1954, his big break comes when he's cast in a play called The Immoralist with Louis Jordan and Geraldine Page. Jimmy gets to play the part of a corrupt Arab houseboy. During rehearsals, Jimmy and the director do not get along. The director wants Jimmy to respect his authority. Instead, Jimmy experiments with his role, changing it each time with a new interpretation. After weeks of backstage battles, Jimmy has had enough. The Immoralist opens on Broadway to good reviews, and Jimmy gives his director two weeks' notice. As Jimmy begins to look for new work, director Elia Kazan has begun looking for a new actor. Kazan is about to cast the lead role of Cal Trask in his new motion picture, East of Eden, and considers Jimmy for the part. Before making his final decision, Kazan holds a screen test in New York for the two finalists. James Dean, and another unknown, Paul Newman. The part of Cal Trask, the choice Hollywood role of the year, goes to James Dean. Before leaving for California, Jimmy meets his co-star, Julie Harris. I remember meeting him for this little screen test. It was just really to see us together, how we looked together. and. At one point, I remember putting my hand like this, and Jimmy said, why do you do that? Do you think you look too old? And I thought, you son of a bitch. I said, I didn't say that. I said that to myself. I said, well, I said, I am older than you. And from then on, it sort of got into the back of my head that I, that I knew that was a sort of device to keep you off guard so that everything was alive. He just reminded me from the very beginning of Tom Sawyer, a guy who would always get you to paint the fence and get you into the terrible scrapes. But it was all like, well, what's life for? It's not to just go plodding in the same places every day, but it's an adventure. Jimmy's first major movie is based on the last third of John Steinbeck's novel, East of Eden. It is the story of a son trying to please his puritanical father who constantly disapproves of him. The father is played by Raymond Massey and the son by James Dean. Their uneasy union in the story is heightened by Dean and Massey's real-life relationship. Jimmy's use of profanity is not appreciated by the Oxford-educated Massey, who is both religious and conservative. During Jimmy's time in Hollywood, he will date many beautiful women including Terry Moore, and later, Ursula Andress. However, the love of Jimmy's life is Pier Angeli, whom he meets while working on East of Eden. Pier, a beautiful Italian actress who has recently arrived in Hollywood, is working on an adjoining soundstage in a picture called The Silver Chalice. Perhaps we'd been filming three or four weeks, and, and he said to me, I want to show you something, and and he uh, pulled out of his pocket a little gold enameled Egyptian charm that you would wear on a chain, and he wore it on his chain. And it opened up, and inside was a lock of her hair from the day that they first met. And he, it was, when he showed it to me, he was so he was moved to tears, and he was, he said he was so happy that he had never experienced anything like this feeling that he felt for her. And there was a kind of 
warmth and a sort of glow about him, especially when he, when you saw them together or when he talked about her. Jimmy and Peer are inseparable, but their relationship has serious problems. Jimmy is totally unpredictable and has constant mood swings. Eventually, Peer breaks off the relationship and to Jimmy's torment, immediately announces her engagement to singer Vic Damone. On the day of the wedding, as Peer and her new husband leave the church, they are greeted by the loud roar of an engine. Seated on his motorcycle across from the church, a broken-hearted Jimmy guns his engine in a painful cry. The woman he loves will never be his. The first time I met Jimmy Dean was in the parking lot at uh, Schwab's drugstore in Hollywood. I'm, everybody knows the famous Schwabadero. I uh, then found out that he was an actor. And I didn't know too much about him then, but he, see, he was a nice guy, really a nice kid. He looked like not an out-of-work actor, but a struggling young kid trying to make his way in the business. And one day, I said to him, uh, I thought I'd like to help people once in a while if I can do something as a cameraman for the movie magazines at, at the time. I said, gee, you know, I'm doing a layout, a movie star layout. And I said, why don't you come along, along with me and kind of get in the background. And when you see me, when I see that my camera is up, kind of sidle over and get in behind whatever star happens to be there, like it was Debbie Reynolds' layout. And he was very cutely and sheepishly and uh, just, the way he said it just flipped me. He said, gee, Frank, th thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. But I don't know. I don't think that. Thanks anyway. I don't think I'll do it. No, thanks. Well, I was invited to East of Eden. I didn't know anything about it. I couldn't even remember the name of it. And I was a little late getting there. I missed all the credits on the East of Eden. And it was down in front. Picture starts right after Kazan's credit. I saw the, just the director credit. And here comes Jimmy Dean. I said, oh, my God. I said to myself, I said, well, he, oh, great. He got himself a bit part. Well, five minutes later, I suddenly realized that he was the star. I said, oh, I was so mad. I couldn't get over it. The minute the picture finished, I ran to a phone. I called him up and said, you dirty, rotten fink. How could you do this to me? You're a star. It was a role that was created for Jimmy, practically. I, they had probably no intention, but this was James Dean. The story embodied his relationship with his father. It utilized his isolation from the rest of the world, the perversity of his perspective, his humor, his need for love. It was as though you rewrote his, his biography. Same person, slightly different story. I thought he was absolutely mesmerizing. I thought his performance was so beautiful and had such variety to it. That was my boy up there. I could just reach up and touch him. He was Jim Dean that I knew, the kid. Beautifully done. As moviegoers line up in droves in a nightly ritual to see Hollywood's newest star, Jimmy has his own ritual. Unknown to his fans, Jimmy drives past the theater, gaping in amazement at the waiting lines. This is the only time that Jimmy gets to witness his success. He will not live long enough to see his other two pictures released. Celebrating his new fame, Jimmy decides to have a sculpture of himself done by artist Kenneth Kendall. I knew who he was. I hadn't seen him perform. He needed a shave, looked a little kind of grubby. He had come uh, to look at the uh, sculpture of Marlon Brando, which he had already seen in New York, and he had decided that he was going to contact me. He asked me, he said, in, a, in his very best little boy manner, uh, very hesitant, uh, w would, would you be interested in sculpting me? which uh, came as a great surprise to me. And I honestly was thinking I had just finished one of Marlon Brando. I had one going of uh, Steve Reeves, who had been a spectacular Mr. America. And I was thinking to myself, honestly, I thought, do you really think you're in this world class of people that I've been doing? 
but I was flattered by the request and I uh, answered that I would. Two weeks after his visit, I went over to Hollywood uh, to a matinee to see East of Eden and I practically fell out of the seat. I just, I thought, good Lord, I know this guy. He knows me. He wants something from me. I just couldn't get over it. Uh, Marlon is heavy as lead compared to Jimmy. Jimmy's mercurial and light and dancing all over the place. That's not Marlon Brando at all. But it was just that we had two good actors. We lost two actors in the crash at Cholam. Uh, James Dean and Marlon Brando. Because if James Dean had have been alive, Marlon couldn't have let Jimmy walk the town away from him. We would have seen a lot more out of Brando than we have. But I think he sort of relaxed in his position. Before James Dean, teenagers were represented on the screen in movies like Andy Hardy Gets Spring Fever. Mickey Rooney starred in a series of 15 of these films, sentimental comedies that exalted family life. Mickey played Andy Hardy, the perfect son, to Judge Hardy, the perfect father. The director of Rebel Without a Cause is Nicholas Ray a socially conscious man whose heroes are frequently social rebels, it is easy for this director to like James Dean. More than three decades since Rebel Without a Cause was made, those who starred with Jimmy remember what it was like. I think the two of them together, Nick Ray and Jimmy Dean, gave us an atmosphere to work in that was really wonderful. I mean, we were all scared and terrified. It was really my first big movie, and I think oh, yeah. most oh. of us. And it was such a warm family together working that you felt very comfortable. I think he was kind of adverse to the culture that was happening in the 50s. Because as I remember, it was a very conforming in time, and there mm -hmm. were certain people that wanted to break away from it. And he kind of took a lead, you know. I used to just sit and marvel at, at these wonderful little things that would come out of him that were just so incredibly creative. And somehow he transcended his roles, and uh, he uh, projected a marvelous vulnerability up there on the screen. Oh, yeah. I didn't feel that he was projecting his vulnerability. I think that Jimmy was one of the first people in our business to share his vulnerability. And, uh, and to say, hey, you know, I, I have a hump on my back, and uh, the best I can do is share that with you. And, uh, and I'm willing to. And I think that's why we identified with him, because every one of us has a hump on his back somewhere. During the filming of Rebel, Jimmy buys himself a Porsche Speedster and enters the world of sports car racing. Winning a number of first-place trophies encourages him in his new passion. Giant will be Jimmy's third and final movie. It is based on Edna Ferber's sprawling novel about two generations of Texans. Its director is George Stevens, a seasoned professional who takes great pride in creating visual authenticity. This time, Jimmy is not the star of the picture. Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson are the stars. On, in Marfa, Texas, on Giant, he was... Uh, using a lariat and I looked at it I said oh boy that's easy anybody can do that he's so sure anybody can hit try it Frank so I took it and I made an ass of myself I couldn't I just didn't know how to do it and everybody laughed and I said do you know what he did he took me after lunch into another room in this hotel where we had lunch for the uh, break he spent 35 minutes teaching me how to do it we were an hour late getting back to the set, but he wouldn't leave until I finally learned how to do it. That's the kind of guy he was. Not using any wigs, Jimmy has his own hair dyed gray and shaved back to give him a receding hairline. Physically, he ages so well that many do not recognize him. With the shooting over, Jimmy, anxious to race again, enters his new Porsche Spider in an upcoming rally in Salinas, California. Friday, September 30th, 1955. Jimmy goes to Competition Motors to pick up his car, which he has named the Little Bastard. Accompanying Jimmy to the race is Rolf Wetheridge, his mechanic. 5.45 p.m. 
As twilight falls, Jimmy approaches the intersection of routes 466 and 41 in Shalem, California. Traveling in the opposite direction on Route 466 is a 1950 Ford Tudor. Suddenly, and without warning, the Ford turns to enter Route 41 directly in front of Jimmy's car. Jimmy swerves to get around the Ford. Upon impact, Jimmy's mechanic is thrown clear of the car. His jaw is broken and his leg is crushed, but he will survive. The 23-year-old college student who is driving the other car escapes with only a bruised shoulder and nose. Jimmy, taking a direct hit, is left trapped in the car with multiple fractures and a broken neck. His death is instantaneous. I was just shocked. I couldn't believe it. I was just in shock. What happened to him couldn't happen to him, you know? because like he said it seemed like his path was his you know i mean he was invincible well uh, uh, like everybody in the world i was i was very shocked of course my shock wasn't to the fact that it was jimmy's fault because he did exactly what we would do with a racing car we wouldn't slam on the brakes and hit the car head on we would accelerate to get away from the automobile knowing that the performance of our car could do that he pulled his stern around to get around the car just like a normal race car guy, and he would have been away just a split second. That guy would have been either past him or around the front of him. He would have been away from him. He just didn't have that one opportunity. It's awful when somebody is taken away from you that young, and when you're just thinking of all the wonderful things they're going to do. Sad to think that he, that he had to die so young. My friend had died, and I hadn't lost anyone. And by that time, he had come to mean a great deal to me, because he was the substance of the proof that it could happen, and that it wasn't a waste of time, and that it all meant something. And all of a sudden, whatever meant something had come to an end. I know that he wanted to become a director. And uh, he always said that his greatest fear was writing. Because he didn't know if he really had anything that was worthwhile saying. You know, because he respected, uh, you know, the great writers. And he didn't want to put his characters in a position where finally when they spoke, he found out that he really had nothing to say. So he had a lot of insecurity about that. But I think he would have turned into a, uh, a great uh, director and writer and filmmaker. You know, I think that's where he was going. You know. On the night James Dean died, artist Kenneth Kendall began working on the statue that Jimmy had wanted. Six months later in Fairmont, Indiana, the finished bronze bust was mounted on a pedestal in the cemetery where Jimmy was buried. As James Dean was being honored in death, he was also being slurred. Shortly after its dedication, the sculpture was sawed off its foundation and has never been recovered. Immediately after its disappearance, rumors began to surface that it had been taken by war veterans who were angered not only because the statue honored a movie star instead of a soldier, but also because they claimed that Jimmy had avoided military service by registering as a homosexual. I know some of the veterans were, you know, kind of up in arms about it, but now I'm, I'm a veteran myself, and uh, I didn't hear anything about it, and it really didn't bother me. I know definitely he was not a homosexual. The last time Jim was home, we went out, and um, I won't reveal it any farther, but I do know definitely that he was not. I really don't pay attention to stories like that. Uh, don't they say that about everybody that gets famous, it seems like? I mean, they're, they're always after him, looking for some kind of dirt. Along with the disappearance of James Dean's bust, many of his personal belongings are also gone. The tape recordings he made of his private thoughts and feelings and the 16 millimeter movies that he took on the set of Giant are still among the missing. However, the most bizarre disappearance was that of James Dean's car itself. Shortly after being displayed in a number of car shows, it too vanished and has never been found. No one knows what would have become of Jimmy had he lived. 
one can only guess. What we do know is that James Dean was one of our most gifted actors. Having made only three motion pictures, he was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Actor in two of them, East of Eden and Giant. He is immortalized in our hearts 